Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, Dr. Casey, th this is going to be a two-part presentation today on uh, the Central Virginia Transportation Authority, followed by uh, a presentation from Julie Tim, one of our guests here today, uh, CEO of the Greater Richmond Transit Company. Uh, would also note that Ian Milliken, who is one of your appointees to the GRTC board, uh, is here with us. Uh, Gary Armstrong and Danny Smith are the other two. They, they could not be here today, uh, but we do have our, our complement of support from GRTC today. So to start off, uh, the CVTA, or Central Virginia Transportation Authority, um, it, it's hard to, to believe it has been uh, almost a year since that was established. Uh, Mr. Carroll will probably tell you it definitely seems like every bit of one year. Uh, he is the, uh, the board's representative there on CVTA. It, it has been a lot of work. Um, again, I'm, I'm not going to read all this stuff to you. It tells you about the tax that was established. Um, Joe jokes quite a bit that he has 50, 35, 15 tattooed on his arm. Now, that's, that's how the funding is split between local, regional, and transit, 50%, 35%, and 15. Uh, again, the Honorable Kevin Carroll is vice chair, but also serves on, I, I think, the finance committee, um, as well as the personnel committee. Um, it, it certainly has been, I think, a labor of love. Um, would also be remiss if we did not thank uh, Plan RVA, Martha Heat over there, Chet Parsons from the TPO, uh, even Matt Harris and, and Debbie Basie from our finance group, uh, and Chessa Walker and Barb Smith um, from our transportation group who have spent a ton of time on, on all of these uh, committees and subcommittees. Uh, again, this is just a map of Plan RVA, but it also uh, represents the jurisdictions that are included within CVTA. They're, they're the very same, PDC uh, 15. Uh, so what is happening in the CVTA? Uh, so uh, up at the top here, you'll see one of the, the items that was included in the code, uh, which requires CVTA to uh, develop uh, priorities so they can prioritize projects and then allocate funding as the CVTA seems appropriate. Uh, this is just a screenshot from one of the umpteen Zoom meetings that has taken place. Again, our very own Chessa Walker, the upper right-hand corner, is the chair of that particular committee, has done a really good job. Um, and if you're interested in spreadsheets, you can see they've done tons of testing to see, you know, how each, each project shakes out to make sure that, that things um, are really prioritizing what would um, at least appear to be um, adequate uh, or appropriate uh, priorities. Um, on the left there is just a general timeline. Uh, so in September, uh, the subcommittee will take this to the CVTA for potential approval. Um, in October, we're going to sit down and meet with all of you guys, uh, the five of you, and go over what staff believes should be some of those regional priorities. Um, if you have any projects that you, that you want us to, to load into that, please just let us know. Um, and we will also, at that time, cover smart scale projects as well, because it's um, that time of year, uh, too. So it's, it's going to be a busy uh, few months. And then with potential board action in November, uh, so staff can s start submitting applications um, at the end of the year. Uh, one of the projects that, that we've covered in, in previous work sessions, the fall line, you're going to start to hear a lot more conversation about this from a regional basis. Uh, there is a groundswell of support for this, you know, really unique regional project. Um, it, it's one of those that um, may not score very well, frankly, on the, you know, when you look at the actual priorities. Uh, but it's important to note that the CVH, CVTA does not have to actually follow the priorities. The, the, the authority can choose to fund uh, projects as they see fit. We're just required to go through a prioritization process, similar to smart scale, and the way that the CTB treats that. If there's a project that just, you know, it, it's kind of a, a, a round peg in a square hole or a square peg in a round hole, um, they, they can see uh, fit to fund that if they believe that it, it rises to that level of importance. Uh, so number three at the top was one of the other items that was included in the code that uh, had to be accomplished, uh, and that was really to look at transit governance. Um, again, not going to read all this to you. There's a couple of important takeaways. Um, number one is that it does look like there's adequate oversight of the 15% between all the localities because the CVTA uh, really does have a say in, in how that is spent, even though it goes, does go uh, to GRTC. Obviously, that there's some ways that, that um, you know, the, the CVTA is assured that it's being spent properly and prioritized properly. Um, in addition, uh, one of the findings was that the city of Richmond and Chesterfield County, uh, as the co-owners of GRT, so should consider adding Henrico, as well as consider 
um, <laughs> reconfiguring uh, the, uh, the setup of GRTC itself. It is a, a stock corporation, and I'm not going to pretend to be the attorney that Mr. Minx is, but he can certainly explain all of that to you if you, if you want um, some more on the details on how all of that is set up. It, it is a somewhat, no, actually not even somewhat, I'm not going to caveat it. It's a completely unique setup for a, a, a transit uh, provider. Probably not one that you're gonna, gonna, going to see anywhere else. Um, the other kind of question that was addressed through this, this study was, you know, are the, the rural and the suburban localities, you know, how, how is their participation? And, and again, you can see here that, um, you know, that, that's really something that we're going to look at in the future. Um, and it's not just going to be based on their contributions, but really on what sort of service do they need? Uh, you know, is it more of a, you know, a shuttle? Um, is it some sort of micro transit? So all that's going to be determined in the future. Um, for now, uh, it's really uh, somewhat of the status quo um, with GRTC looking at a few things, and I'll cover those in, in another slide. I, I did want, want to show this to you. This is a very poor copy of the actual stock that we own uh, in GRTC. It's the only one I've ever been able to find. Uh, Jeff may have the, the actual uh, somewhere, but you can see that uh, we, we have our five shares. <laughs> It certainly, certainly predates my, my tenure here. Uh, <laughs> five out of 10, yeah. Uh, and, and then, you know, I, I will uh, I'll close with this and segue over, over to Ms. Tim. Um, so from a CBTA regional transit uh, perspective, the, the regional uh, public transportation plan was approved in spring of 21. You could see there were, that were, there were a few priorities there. Number one was to maintain existing service. Uh, that's what one of the things that the CVTA thought was important, but also to start looking at micro mobility. So there was some money uh, and funding set aside to look at things like bike or transit um, and how to better serve some of these localities that don't have traditional fixed, uh, fixed route transit. Um, as, and then next was capital projects, and then looking at uh, prioritized expansion, again, with a, with a caveat that um, staffing, equipment, and funding uh, would have to be there to do that. So um, that, that's kind of how that was prioritized. And again, this is going to be a conversation moving forward um, with our uh, partners at uh, GRTC. And uh, before I kick it over to Julie, I, I will close with this. Um, you may remember this uh, from... Uh, both conversations and the adoption of the CIP back in April, uh, but this is uh, how, how the board uh, right now has uh, chosen to uh, to uh, distribute the local funding. So those are all of those projects. Um, staff is starting work on all those, and we are you know be happy to provide you all um, a little more granular update um, you know as part of those uh, th those meetings with you in the uh, October November timeframe to go over regional priorities and, and smart scale. So with that, if there, if there are any questions to the board, I will uh, hand the baton over to Julie Tim from GRTC. Thank you. Thank you. I promise this is not the whole presentation, but I'll be showing about less than half of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, Mr. Casey, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I have been with GRTC now since September of 2019 when I was recruited to be the CEO there. Within approximately four months of becoming the CEO, we entered the pandemic, and so I apologize that I have not been able to see you in person uh, prior to this time, but I blame the pandemic. That is my story, and I'm sticking to it for everything for the past year. It has been a very challenging year for advancing transit in the region. We've had a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges, and I really love the fact that I'm able to give you a little bit of a primer today. I'm going to check the clock to make sure I stay on time. GRTC is the Greater Richmond Transit Company. Uh, that was a great lead-in, so I'll probably skip over some of the information I was hoping to tell you about because I believe that um, Mr. Smith already gave a very good primer about how uh, we have some oversight and how we're structured. We primarily provide the services of local bus, commuter bus, bus rapid transit and paratransit services. We primarily focus in the city of Richmond, the county of Chesterfield, and the county of Henrico. We are looking at an expansion of that service pre-COVID. When I came on, there was regional uh, um, decision-making going on and prioritization for expansion of BRT and local service, which was part of the conversation around the CBTA funding. How do we leverage some of those resources to really expand on mobility and have that regional connectivity? COVID did put a, a halt on that, and we'll talk about what the impact of COVID and CBT were on GRTC and slowing down our growth. 
Uh, just to let you know that there were, have been a lot of questions about how successful the BRT has been. Uh, it was launched in 2018, and how successful the, tr uh, the redesign of the system was that happened in 2018, and how successful is GRTC. I'll put a shout out to my board member. Those all happened before I got here, but in a time when the nation was experiencing double-digit declines in transit service, GRTC, because of the actions of the board in this region, experienced double-digit increases in transit ridership. That system redesign and that implement implementation of BRT and the foresight of this region and in investing in transit also helped protect us through the COVID pandemic. Now, what our, our system looks like as far as governance, very quickly. Uh, a couple of eye charts here. This isn't, don't please feel like you need to see this. This is illustrative. We have, of course, our two shareholders, 50%, City of Richmond, Chesterfield. Uh, you'll see the dotted lines. Uh, we have an annual shareholder meeting where our shareholders, Chesterfield and Richmond, nominate and appoint three board members each. Those are voted on, and those are our board members for the year. Uh, they can uh, hire the CEO. The CEO at that point, again, an eye chart, just to show you the complexity of our organization. The CEO then uh, manages the overall organization as a whole, where the board sets policy and helps to identify the strategy. The CEO takes that strategy and works the team to develop specific tactics and put those in play, and then reports those tactics back to the CEO and back to the board. So the board is responsible for overseeing our budget, making sure that we do implement our strategy, making sure that we are efficient and effective in putting that service in place. Uh, there is a role that each of the shareholders have in participating in this process aside from actually establishing who our board members are, and that is through the staff members. The staff members here do work directly with the staff from each of the jurisdictions. And the work that was done by the staff in Chesterfield to implement CBTA priorities are the same staff that work with us every single year to set the priorities of Chesterfield. Uh, those are the, the uh, projects that you might have seen come before you in the past about possible extensions, possible studies in partnership with DRPT, and those then come before you for approval in the funding process. That's historically been the way it's it's worked. So not only have you had a chance to provide the leadership and the governance structure for GRTC, you also approve the funding that comes to support the routes in your jurisdiction. Now, currently, GRTC, I, I bring this up because there's a couple of reasons why I bring this up. We are experiencing a staffing shortage. It's important to know that as we went into CVTA, the concept was that CVTA would provide GRTC with significant resources to expand service in Chesterfield and Ryko, Richmond, and throughout the region. Because of COVID, we are experiencing as many CDL providers are, or employers are, we have a staffing shortage of approximately 12 employees, plus we have another 26 who are on long-term disability because of asthma and other conditions that don't allow them to work currently. Until we're able to, uh, to recover from the staffing shortage, we won't be looking to expand. And that will be a, part, a critical part of the discussion on how we're using CBTA dollars. Now, when we talk about the expenses and how GRTC is managed, and one of the board responsibilities every year is to review our budget and to approve our budget and then to watch how we manage to budget, favorable or unfavorable. Uh, breakdown in this chart really shows that the majority of our funding, the majority of our expenses, really go around the service that we put on the street. It's focused on operations. And year-over-year -year growth in those costs are because of the year-over-year -year growth in the operations we put on the street. Now, this past year, we've had a couple more increases due to the COVID expenses. We've had sick pay expenses. We had cleaning expenses. Those are our new expenses that are us. We identified those, and we're trying to manage and budget to those. Um, but the, for the most part, you'll see that there was, there's been a commitment from GRTC to become more effective and more efficient in how we operate, where those expenses are, and how we can extend service with the dollars that we have in place. Now, the pie chart on the right is the same pie chart from the previous slide, and that shows our adopted FY22 budget for GRTC. This, the series of pie charts shows you the progression of where we were pre-COVID to where we are now and how our revenues are coming in. Originally, or primarily, we received federal, state, local funding, self-generated revenues through fares and advertising, and through partnerships with uh, corporations such as Bon Secours or through VCU. The blue 8.1 million that you see in the, the top starting going clockwise around is the federal money. That is money that we could otherwise use for capital, 
but we do flex it into operations to keep our expenses controlled at the local level, and it's used for preventative maintenance to keep us in a state of good repair. The orange is the state money that comes to us by formula funds. The more productive we are and the higher our ridership, the, more, the bigger slice of that pie we receive here in the region. The next two, the gray and the yellow, are City of Richmond and Enrico. When we did go into COVID, there was a, a dual action of the legislation allowed them to reduce their local funding to GRTC with the understanding that CVTA would replace that to support our existing service and to expand. But it also had the, uh, a role of when COVID hit, everyone's budget's restricted. And so as GRTC, we felt as a partner, we need to also help our local partners protect their budgets. So that big black gap is actually the amount of money that we were able to use from the federal relief dollars to support our local partners, to support our riders in zero fare, and to support the coverage of the increased costs associated with COVID. Moving out of last year's budget into this year's budget, we then were able to come back and use the CVTA money for its intended purpose to support. There is still federal relief dollars in our budget. We're using that to continue zero fares and also to support the use of CVTA money um, as our plan shows. Now, I want to address it very quickly, if I might. We are using FY21 CVTA dollars, that 15%, to support this FY22 need. CVTA was what well, was implemented in July. It took time to set up properly so it could be done correctly. It also took time to collect those funds. So while the, those funds were collected, it's hard to use money when you don't know exactly how much is coming in and then when you had the pandemic on top of it. And so next year, again, we don't know exactly how much is going to come in, but we wanna be able to plan for it with fiscally responsible um, methods. So FY21, we expect that after on the accrual basis to uh, come to GRTC in approximately $21 million. We'll use about 20 million of it for operations and about one to two million of it for capital needs and for studies. Now you'll notice that that adds up to more than the 21 we expect. We'll use the federal money again to cover any gap. We'll also use the federal money to cover fares. And I'll talk a little bit more about zero fares moving forward and why it's important to maintain that through this fiscal year. Uh, when we talk about the federal money, I talked about the federal money that comes from the 5307. Um, that's our federal formula that comes over. We receive about 11 million of that a year. The intended purpose of federal money is to be able to buy our infrastructure, our vehicles, our shelters, and keep us moving capital. It's not necessarily intended for operations. However, there is a, a clause that most transit agencies use to flex money from that capital budget over into operations to support the preventative maintenance and the state of good repair of existing assets. We flex a significant portion of our money into our operational budget that also relieves pressure from our local partners, the full funding impact of service. The remaining money we use, we leverage with state and local. Now we apply for state money and that state match money can be anywhere between zero to 68% match, depending on how it is um, of, of awarded. Usually we get approximately 50% of the money that we request from the state for projects such as desktops, administrative needs, and we get 68% for onboard technology, vehicle replacement, which means we have to use a very little of our federal money, we get a lot of state money, and then we get a 4% local match. We have to use some amount of match for it. That 4% local match comes from a proportion of all of our jurisdictions, and in the future it will also come proportionately from CVTA to cover the use and replacement of our buses and physical assets. In FY22, sorry, I'm moving forward, I lost my place. So what that looks like, when I first came to GRTC, I asked the, the team to put together a three-year capital plan so we could see the amount of money that we have and where we need it. This, uh, unfortunately, is out of date. We're in the process of redoing it. COVID uh, put our FY21 and 22 plans in, in uh, a little bit of a tailspin. We had to delay some projects. You'll see that we prioritize our funding and the amount of money we have based on uh, key priorities, seven key priorities. Anything that's safety or regulatory gets funded first. A committed project that is underway that needs a little bit of money to finish it is second. That preventative maintenance money we talked about that keeps our operations costs lower is third. The fourth is a state of good repair. When we have to do our vehicle replacement so we don't have old buses, our shelters, our facilities to make sure that we can maintain the maintenance of our assets. Then we look at business efficiencies. What can we do and what can we invest in to reduce our costs and work more effectively and efficiently with the dollars we have? The next one is service improvements. What can we do to improve the service experience and efficiencies for our riders and our communities for their wealth building? 
And lastly, the last thing we do is grow. We want to plan for growth, but we don't invest for growth until we make sure that our existing infrastructure and needs are supported. Now you'll see that in this chart, uh, number six, there was a large spike in number six, which is the service improvements. We were hoping pre-COVID to be able to launch some infrastructure projects, projects for transfer centers, for articulated buses on the pulse, and for other needs as we were going to launch off of the growth of 2018. Those have been put on hold, which is why we are redoing this. You can also see that a significant amount of our capital resources go into that item three, which is that preventative maintenance flex into operations. That spike, the gray spike you see number four, is because we have a natural cycle of fleet replacement. We have 146 vehicles, and we don't all want to replace them all in one year. We try and stagger it and smooth it out, but we do get periodic peaks, and that was one of our peaks. Okay. Oops. So the question is, is who's our market? Who are we serving with all of this bus money? Um, what's the point of us being out there? We have a couple of sources of data about who we're serving, what our market is, and I'm, I come a little bit from a transit background, but I've also come from a transit background, and I come from a business background. And I believe that good transit is leveraged through good business decisions and understanding your market. Our core market pre-COVID was the home to work market. It's people going from home to work and back again, with some occasional use also for medical, social, um, healthcare, education, shopping, and for recreation. But the vast majority was that home to work, and it was from residents who lived or worked within approximately a half a mile of where our buses and service was located. So very much defined by high density land use, housing, and jobs. Now going into 2000, when we expected to serve 10 million trips, uh, COVID hit, we're probably somewhere around seven to eight million trips, which actually is a, another point that I'll make in just a second, is that when COVID hit, we had another range of data to use for, um, to understand our market. And that was looking at our market by our mode. A lot of uh, transit riders across the country, you'll, hear, you'll have heard in the news, transit ridership was down 95% across the country. You probably saw those nationwide. Those were for commuter services. People who could telework, who used buses and trains to commute to work. Our mode share for the commuter service, as you can see from the very far left, or sorry, from the, the far left chart, the third column over, she was at 93% decrease, that very, very small row, that actually was pre-COVID our express market. A very small share of our ridership came from the express service. So when across the country, ridership dropped by 95%, ours dropped by 20%. Our predominant mode share, our market, is that local market to and from work and to and from the essential workplace. When COVID hit and we dropped, we also saw where they were coming from and where they were going to. They're coming from ec economically disadvantaged communities. They needed to continue to work. These are, are people who worked in the restaurants that didn't close, that stayed open because of um, delivery or takeout. These are people who worked in our grocery stores, who kept the supplies on the shelves when we could, when we didn't run out of toilet paper. These are the people who worked at our hospitals that cleaned the floors and the nurses that took care of our children. Uh, these are the essential workforce, and they stayed on the buses, and they kept our ridership high so that even now today, when much of the country is still struggling to retain ridership or regain ridership, our local bus service is back to pre-pandemic levels. Now specifically, what does this mean for Chesterfield? Chesterfield currently has two lines. One is the express line. So thinking about what I just mentioned with our express service market, when COVID hit, before COVID, we had the line that went from Brander Mill to downtown, and it's the, the Commonwealth 20. Um, I have to thank Mr. Winslow. You are actually my representative. I live in Brandon Mill. Okay. Uh, so it, it, is a, it was a very well-loved service, um, it, a productive service at 95 passenger trips per day. When COVID hit, that went down to 23. We cut some of the service back and we put smaller vehicles on it because the need wasn't there. The need's still not there. So the question we have is, do we put that service back? And the answer is not yet. We wait until the need is there. And we might actually even look at some of the microtransit services and van pool services that are more cost effective than the larger buses to put that back. There's obviously a need pre-COVID. The question is, will there be a need post-COVID? And we will continue to work with the communities to see that. Now, the flip side of that is that at, once COVID came along, you also had the, um, the initiative, you were putting Route 111 in place, which is the John Tyler Community College. That launched exactly at the same week that COVID shut us down as a region. Uh, 
we had to make a quick decision. Do we continue to put that service out or do we delay it? And we worked with uh, Chesterfield staff, we worked with you, and the decision was there are communities there, the service, the market's there, let's go ahead and put it out. And what we found is that when we put the service out, almost immediately we exceeded projections of what that was supposed to serve in non-pandemic times. And today, um, I think it's hard to see on here, but it's the fourth bullet down that current ridership is still greatly exceeding projections. We're also going to be expanding that service. We're gonna extend it a little bit further um, to the pre-con area. We were going to do Greenlee community. Unfortunately, there was some complications. We needed a bus turnaround, but we are doing that, and we're doing it at a cost neutral because of the layovers we had at John Tyler Community College. We can actually use that same time to go a little bit further. And the Greenlee community, there are sidewalks that will allow them to easily access that new route extension. So we're very excited about that. That will start in September. And this is a, a good definition of where we our core market works. Our core market works where there are people who live and where they're going to need to get to jobs. And this extension is a prime example of that. Now, when we look at moving forward for priorities, pre, uh, during the COVID pandemic, when we looked at the priorities of how to spend CVTA money, the first thing we looked at was how to uh, leverage the money to expand existing services in our existing service districts. We didn't really focus on the microtransit initially. Uh, and what we found were that Chesterfield came up with three key priorities, or a couple more as well, but the key priorities were the, um, the Route 60, which you already were looking at studying, and you're also looking at the 86, the 84, and the 85. Now the 86 and the um, 84 are the, the two ovals, not the circles. And if you look at the oval that's going southbound, there's a significant amount of residences along that corridor. And the one that's east-westbound, there are a significant number of jobs along that corridor. Implementing these two local bus routes will have a significant impact on connecting people where they live to jobs where they work. So this is a pretty significant um, improvement that we would like to see prioritized when we talk with CBTA about what the regional priority should be for the bus expansion money. The one that's in the circle, that one is also a really great connection in that it provides a connection between people who need social services in low-income communities to the social services district. The question is uh, that, that remains is considering the other priorities and considering our market share, is that best served with a 40-foot bus or is that best served with maybe a micro transit or an on-demand transit that serves more of Chesterfield County and brings them in? So over the next year, we hope to study that and come back with a recommendation on how we can better serve that if it's the 40-foot bus or if it's another mode of transit. We will be doing that same kind of study of micro transit and on-demand transit around the entire region. So in FY23, we expect to leverage FY22 CBTA dollars to protect existing service and use about 20, 21, 22 million dollars of it. The remaining money we expect to have received between 28 to 30 million, depends on the regional economy. The rest of it will be used to logically and sustainably advance priorities in transit. Now those could be these priorities. Richmond has priorities and RICO has priorities and then the micro transit priorities. Um, and how do we prioritize those? Which get funded first, second, or third? That will be a collaborative effort over this coming year. Um, when we look beyond that, I'm going I'm to speed up quickly here because I think I've used way more than my time. Uh, overall, when we look at the system, we are investing in our bus stops, our bus routes, and our bus connections. Those are priorities that we talked about. We're going to invest more in BRT growth north-south because that is the core connectivity of the transit mobility network. We're going to be looking at those commuter services, where to expand them, and where to convert them to van pools or on-demand service. We will continue to look at regional microtransit around the entire region and where it's necessary to maybe put that in place with CBTA dollars or state dollars or local dollars or federal dollars. We'll find the funding source that's appropriate for that type of transit. And then of course, we are always looking to future-proof. When do we bring on an electrified fleet? We're all CNG now. When do we look at autonomous vehicles? When does that come on board? And when do we look at um, other solutions and the, the fair equity issues that are ongoing? I didn't touch that the way I said, but I talked too long, so I'm going to stop there. And again, thank you so much for your time and stop so I can answer any questions. Wonderful, you've done a wonderful presentation. Board members, any questions or comments? Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, so obviously, uh, thank you, Ms. Tim, for your work. And um, uh, thank you for choosing Brainerd Mill, uh, a wonderful community to live in, I, I hear. Um, uh, I appreciate you bringing up 
uh, access Chesterfield, you know, one of the things that we, um, uh, Chesterfield kind of gets tagged with is uh, not having a, as many routes as other jurisdictions. And I think that the 437 square miles that is our county sometimes is so large that people may not fully understand just how much territory that is. Uh, Access Chesterfield, of course, has been uh, extremely successful in the county in connecting people. And I don't know, I haven't seen um, current numbers, and I don't know if, Jesse, if, if, if that's something that you have, but um, certainly that's something I know the entire board has been proud of, along with that route on Route 1. Uh, we spent a lot of time um, separate and apart from from GRTC, not that there's anything wrong with GRTC, but we just did a lot of homework to see that that route would be successful before applying for that grant. And uh, so we, I think all of us on this board at the time of that vote felt pretty confident that uh, that was going to be successful. Uh, as you look at Chesterfield, what challenges are you seeing that are most unmet at this point in time. So that's the, going to be the point of the micro-mobility study. We also have that same question in our other jurisdictions, especially Goochland and Palatine and Hanover, that um, there's a desire to see more connectivity and more mobility, but we haven't defined as a region or as DRTC what that need is. So part of the micro-mobility study will be working with each jurisdiction to identify what are the needs? Where are your senior citizens? Where are your communities of need that are low income that need access to jobs? Where are your communities that might have other needs besides that? Uh, do, you, do you need help getting people to uh, recovery centers? Do you need help finding ways to food deserts? What are those needs that aren't being served or aren't being served maybe at their, their highest and best use? And then what is the mobility solution that can serve it. So I don't have an answer for you right now, but I hope to have an answer for you in six to eight months. Fair enough. I appreciate that. And again, thank you for your work. Thank you. Other questions or comments, board members? I, I greatly appreciate your presentation. I'm looking at from looking back. I, I've often advocated to prior boards, I've been here quite a while, that, that, that I had a, I just had an inclination that that, that route 111 would be successful. And you've proven that today. You've demonstrated. I mean, I mean, and I've been saying this for years prior to your being here, Ms. Tim. So I'm glad to see you here. And I appreciate the studies that you are initiating. And you're right. I think there's going to be a hybrid. Mm -hmm. There'll be no one situation that will fit this all together. But what it showed was during this economically distressed time, it showed that the average per capita income was $29,000, which we knew. Uh, and we also knew that they that those uh, individuals need to get to work as well. And so you've proven that with the route. And I look forward to expansion and other uh, avenues and certainly the study. Uh, we're excited about that. Uh, I do have one question in regards to uh, the infrastructure capital needed at bus stops in terms yes. of places to accommodate citizens going inclement weather. Yes, sir. What, where are we with that situation at this point? What are your plans? What are you contemplating? I hesitate to say because sometimes when you say something, you jinx it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Do what you choose. Thank you. Uh, so I know that uh, we, there's a lot of feels around congressional earmarks, mm -hmm. and there was an opportunity for uh, agencies across the country to request earmarks. I believe Chesterfield is on a couple lists for some for transit. Mm -hmm. um, I was also able to request an earmark for transit shelters, at especially in economically disadvantaged communities, but throughout our system. So that did make it onto a list, whether or not it gets funded, but it got ad added to a list at the amount of $1.9 million. We do have a strategy for implementing and putting that out there. Currently only 5% of our 1,600 bus stops have shelters, which yeah. is way too few. Yeah. I myself have stood at uh, bus stops without it and then come to meetings drenched to the core. Mm -hmm. It creates community bonding on the bus, but it certainly isn't comfortable, and I look forward to and am hopeful for the Funding. It's on Senator uh, uh, Representative Kane's list. Yes. So uh, any support that you can provide to help us get that money here, we'll put more shelters out. That sounds great. I'm, I'm sure Marianne is hearing that as she uh, 
works with our uh, delegation. And certainly, I, I greatly appreciate your hard work, and I want to also recognize our appointee, uh, to, or our board member, if you will, you stand up, if you would, Ian, so we can recognize him. He's been serving on GRTC board for a few years, and we appreciate his service and his involvement. We thank you so very much for being here. Thank you so we much, We appreciate thank you. today. I might add, Dr. Case, that this will be a great segue to our annual discussion and presentation given all the changes we see coming relative to CVTA and relative to GRTC and our partners in Rico and Richmond and others. I think this will be a good annual discussion for us. Mr. Uh, if, if you all concur, board members. Mr. Chairman, I do, and just to attack on, you know, um, even this in the context, this discussion in the context of uh, a review of planning and some of the zoning that's happened annually, because that's part of this too, is uh, where we have some greater density is connecting these communities of greater density uh, where, where it uh, you know, fiscally makes more sense to do so and ridership wise makes more sense to do so. And so that overlay I think is really important to the discussion. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I feel confident that staff is going to make sure that as we move forward with the CVTA that we have all the information that we need to relay to GRTC when they're trying to, and, and, and also all, all of us on the CVTA are trying to determine what the priority needs are going to be, not just regionally, but certainly individually for us in, in Chesterfield County. Um, you know, we're going to be moving forward. You know, in, in the next phase, um, you know, there'll be um, uh, hiring a financial advisor to come to the CVTA. Uh, Matt uh, and staff have done a preliminary on that, and part of that will be to show um, how the uh, CVTA will be able to leverage funds in the future and what that will look like for bonding for the region, similar to what the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority and the Hampton Roads Transportation Authority has accomplished. And, and certainly, if you look at their accomplishments, they're very large. Of course, their numbers are a little bit bigger than ours because the majority of, of their monies goes directly into their fund where we get a 50% back to our communities. But, but nevertheless, uh, as the prioritization process moves forward and we get those lists developed, and uh, we're, we're getting there. So uh, maybe sometime uh, next year, and maybe the beginning or middle of next year, we'll be at a point where we'll be consulting I don't know if Matt's shaking his head back there or not, but we'll be consulting on <clears throat> what uh, what the bonding could look like and bringing that back um, certainly before the community and before the board because we're going to have to make our decisions, as, uh, as Jesse said, on what priority projects we want to uh, try and move forward in that 35%, and obviously we know what we've put forward on our, our 50% so far. So look forward to continuing to represent all of you uh, and represent our community on the, on the CVTA and work with our partners, and I think it's been a, a very good experience so far. I don't know, there's no reason for me to believe it's not going to continue that. Way.